Welcome to episode 53 of The Hard Truth About B2B E-Commerce. I'm your co-host, Isaiah Bollinger, and I'm here with Tim on a stormy day in Massachusetts in my area. So, <laughs> Yes, right. Well, the storm is coming to where I am in New York. Uh, we'll see what, what it's like later today. I'm Timothy Peterson. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to another uh, great episode. Let me give you uh, give a couple shout outs to our sponsors. Uh, the first uh, sponsor mentioned, it goes out to Punch Out To Go, a global B2B integration company specializing in connecting commerce business platforms with e-procurement and ERP applications. Punch Out To Go's iPass technology seamlessly links business applications to automate the flow of purchasing data. With their solution, you can immediately reduce integration complexities for punch out catalogs, electronic purchase orders, invoices, and other B2B sales order automation documents to accelerate your business results. Thank you to punch out to go And a very special thank you to Balance. We happen to have as our guest, someone from Balance, which is amazing, right? Uh, but I'm gonna still give the shout out. Uh, Balance is a B2B e-commerce payment solution that works for you and for your buyers. It offers a seamless one-click checkout for almost any payment method, including ACH, wire, checks, cards, even terms. It's used by leaders in B2B e-commerce, and it's as easy as buying a shirt from Amazon. Check them out at getbalance.com, book a session, tell them what your needs are. They are the first dedicated payment platform to B2B e-commerce. 100% tailored to your needs. Thanks again to our sponsor, Balance. And I'll let you correct me anywhere that I was wrong. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> everyone. <laughs> so, yeah, we're special guests today. Uh, I'm excited to introduce you. Uh, CEO of Balance uh, Bar. Let me let me see if I can say your last name right. Is it uh, Garan? Or is that, am I saying that right? Or no, not at all. Jerome. <laughs> Yeah. Juron, okay. Is that it's yeah. hard to so G is tough because it could be it could go a lot of yeah. and it's a G E, but you say it like it's a G I. So I, okay. it's weird. Yeah, okay. weird really is Jewish <laughs> people. <It's> so weird. <laughs> so you're based out of Israel. Uh, you founded Balance. Uh, is it what has it been two years now, or how how long has two years? Uh, yes, yeah. sir. Okay. So tell us about how you got into Balance. What made you even think like, hey, you know, there's something here. And obviously, it seems to be going well, right? <laughs> yeah, I I was just getting more and more intimate in, with payments, and then I got intimate with B two B e commerce. So the story is, you know, first of all, the context of my life. I'm an Israeli, so I was an officer in the army uh, for at least uh, four and a half years. Um, I managed few tanks. Uh, this is what I did, and then. I started my career, I studied industrial engineering and I did my master's in philosophy actually. And then PayPal was the first job that I had that got me very intimate with FinTech in general. And I got fascinated about just the innovation of trying to take something offline to the online. In B2C back then, it was pretty obvious. It was uh, the days that eBay and PayPal separated um, yeah. and PayPal was public. Mm -hmm. um, I was on the intersection between risk, strategy, and product. I got really intimate with risk in general. PayPal was like the place if you're a fraudster to go and try to find ways to make money. <laughs> so um, a lot of account takeovers, installing financials, people trying to purchase credit cards in the dark web and using them on the PayPal platform or just hacking to your PayPal account. And you know, all those phishing emails, it's very common today. We get a uh, lot actually at work now. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, do I get a lot. Yeah. yeah, and they are getting better and better. Yeah. Uh, if the, in the early days when I was there, like a uh, long time ago, it was like really shitty and only like the ones that really didn't pay any attention, click them. Today, it's like, looks really real. So it's become, yeah becomes so really what hard. they start doing is now they impersonate our employees and they're like hey i need something from you but it's oh not really <laughs> oh uh, wow it could, be, it could be someone else so they like figure out who we all are probably on linkedin and start like impersonating everybody oh so 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 that's yeah okay so that's a challenge right like yeah. you need to be very focused 
Yeah. And you're uh, like, well, they, you can kind of tell, like, this doesn't make sense. Like, why is he asking him? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, completely. But, like, completely. especially new employees, they're, like, the most confused, right? Because they, like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you say so. It sounds weird, but... Yeah, uh, they're just trying to, like, please everybody, right? <laughs> true, true. Um, so that was the days at PayPal. Then I wanted to learn how to build things and got fascinated with uh, one of the first companies trying to tackle B2B payments uh, from the from the net term side, a company called Behalf. Mm -hmm. And that, that was like the first generation of companies trying to do it. There was Behalf and Funbox. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we use we use fun backs in our in our tough days when, when we needed money back <laughs> the first couple of years. <laughs> it was kind of expensive though, so we moved away from that pretty quickly after we uh, grew a little bit. Yeah. More. <laughs> it is, it is. But uh, that was as the first generation, and Israel was a big hub around it. Um, behalf um, versus Funbox. I was, I was one of the people helping move the technology of evaluating credit risk for buyers and paying out vendors uh, faster to, make, to push you to the online space. It was a great experience. And this is where I got intimate with B2B e-commerce for the first time. It was, you know, B2B e-commerce got so much exposure. It feels like it's exploding in the last few years, but it wasn't like that, like, you know, even six years ago, right? Not it feels long, like it, it feels so different. It feels just, you know, the industry is so different right now. So it was tough back then. Um, and also, you know, it was the first wave of companies. So you just needed to learn a lot. Um, so that was that. Then I created my first company, which is in healthcare. It was based on like a personal pain of mine. My father had cancer. It took a lot of time to see an oncologist. I decided to leave my day job and just trying to figure out ways how to minimize the time it takes to book an appointment. So we figure out that one of the main elements that creates this um, fat in those queues is um, no-shows, people not showing to their appointment, uh, which was ridiculous. Like 25% of people didn't show to their appointment. Mm. Um, also the you static backfill them quickly, right? Like there's nothing you can do. You just have to wait, right? Yeah. And everyone are so frustrated. Like you, 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 you took you three weeks to see your physician. Then you sit in the, you know, you sit in the medical practice and you just see that people are not arriving. Like what, what's going on? I, I could be them. Um, so it was that and the static appointment length um not going too much in deep but when you have when when you know the context of a patient you can adjust the appointment length uh to be relevant for his needs so we just did two things one we first of all we used a lot of data like data from the healthcare provider the hmo and general data we, we had uh we were able to possess and just create an algorithms to predict those bottlenecks so we did like smart overbooking and adjustments of appointment length and just help HMOs to be more efficient. Um, so that was the first experience. And then we said, um, okay, selling to big HMOs was not something we want to do for seven years. Like it wasn't, it wasn't that. Um, and then we, we, we decided that, okay, let's tackle the, the big challenge we remember from our days in fintech, which is B2B payments and make them something that is not suck, right? Mm -hmm. Make them something that works. Mm -hmm. um, so we just invested a lot of time on thinking about the problem first. Even though we had the experience, we just talked to tens, if not, I think it was more than 200 businesses to understand the both sides of the equation. And the problem we wanted to solve is we wanted to make a world in which the flexibility for buyers is the same as they know from the offline. We didn't want to educate them. We didn't want to change how they do business because it doesn't work. But on the vendor side, we wanted to make him feel like it's a credit card experience, right? Like it's instant and always the same and easy. Um, 
So we joined Y Combinator um, in SF and just started to learn about a new wave of companies, um, what is known as B2B marketplaces, um, just entrepreneurs um, that looks at archaic verticals and trying to innovate, um, creating demand and supply and steel and all those different verticals. And we got fascinated about them. So we just created um, like a Stripe approach for B2B payments, which is API first from one side, but consumer grade business checkout on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, so the way it's been done today is that, first of all, the, the platform is very API oriented, very much looking at technology companies and help them scale B2B payments. So when you, when you put balance online, the entire account receivable processes, in, it's been done automatically and you receive payments as easy and instantly like a card payment all the time. Now on the buyer side, they get all the flexibility they know from the offline space. So the way it looks is that the, the, the checkout is white labeled. So you have your own brand on top of it. It's a very simple snippet to put on your website. And then when customers arrive, they can request a self-serve invoice and they can pay with wires and checks. They can pay with ACH or card. What we do is the back is technology that automates the account receivable process. For example, if you want to pay with a wire, we have the ability to connect between the incoming payment and the invoice and notify you that the payment was successful. In the before balance, they needed to wait for the payment to arrive and see that the amount that arrived matches the invoice. And then they did this like fuzzy logic of saying, okay, this payment is is attached to this invoice. Okay, the payment is 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 settled. The we payment still do that <laughs> in our quick. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is so bad. We still so have we a lot of people that. paying us by check. You know, like it's hard to it, they can pay by ACH and QuickBooks, but they just like they yeah, just, they'll just send a check. They, like, they, and then they're like, oh, it's coming, it's coming. It's like, what do you mean it's coming? You're like three weeks overdue. Like, <laughs> oh, they love the check excuses. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very common. And this is why I don't see it change significantly because it's such a strong thing. As long as the buyers have the power in the equation between vendors and buyers, buyers that pay with checks for all the vendors will continue to pay with checks because they can. Yeah. You, it's um, just so hard to stop. I mean, it, it, and what are we going to do? Be like, oh, we're not going to accept your checks. Like, I mean, we don't accept it. checks. Like, yeah. okay. So I, I stopped <laughs> doing it at the, one of the agencies I advise. We, uh, we stopped uh, accepting checks about two years ago and people complained for a few months and then they just uh, all of a sudden everybody realized that they could do things other than the checks, but it's an agency oh, that nice. has about 200 clients uh, and it actually worked like, you know, cause we just got tired oh, wow. of it because the approach was automated and we wanted to keep it more automated. And so it, it, it again, it was like, we gave people like a three month notice and then the three months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we we oh, might oh, have yeah. to roll out one of these days, although I, I'm getting sick of these. But it finally <laughs> happened. Everyone said, everyone said, okay, fine. Now we're done. And, and now <laughs> it's two years later and nobody, nobody sends a check and, no, and it's actually pretty great. <laughs> you know, so, so I have amazing. some questions then, because let's say I'm uh, buying on your, on your, I'm a customer or not, not a customer of balance. I'm a customer using balance. Um, mm -hmm. and, buy. and I want like, I'm expecting like not to pay for 30 days or sometimes 60 days. <clears throat> how does that like, how does that work? And how do you know, like, how do you trust that I'm going to pay? Like I check out and I say that I'm going to pay and I get my like huge order. How do you guys deal with people and audit the risk? And um, obviously you have a risk background, but I'm assuming yeah. everyone's equally trustworthy. And we have our customers in the B2B space. They have like analysis on who to give credit to and they, they try and do that themselves, you know? Yeah. So, so you know how it works today, as you said, like there's account receivable departments uh, and yeah. they do analysis of each new buyer that arrives. It takes something between 
I don't know, we, in our analysis, it's between seven days and 21 days. And in the onboarding process, at the end, they can say, okay, you'll be able to pay with net terms on this amount, uh, which is like a revolving credit line that they are willing to get. So this is like the, this is like the standard, um, gotcha. the offline process. Mm -hmm. The problem with, when you want to do it online, you want to scale B2B payments. You want to, you want to go in like acquire buyers online. You want to make it more towards like B2C and, and it's not scalable. So what Balance did in this white labeled approach, the first stage, it can be in the onboarding and it can be in the checkout itself. We evaluate the risk in a process that takes something between six to eight seconds. We enable them to connect their banks with open banking platforms like Plaid and others. We take bureau data and we have uh, specific data sources uh, and we have our own data. And at the end, we get an answer that really takes less than 10 seconds. And based on the configuration the merchants uh, like, like for example, they can say that everyone are getting net 30. So they get approved for net 30 and now they just need to choose how they want to pay. So if they pay with an ACH, we will auto debit their account after 30 days. And if they want to pay with invoice, they get an invoice and can just pay on the 16 of each month because this is where they pay all their vendors. The cool thing about it is that it doesn't matter how the buyer choose to pay and whenever he paid along this month the vendor and the marketplace, in cases of marketplaces, customers, get paid instantly and the same way. So the flexibility is on the buyer side, but on the vendor side, it's a standardized process. Always so, the same. So a question then, do you guys have a, a version or a response to buy now, pay later for B2C, kind of like Klarna, Sezzle, Afterpay? Uh, is there something also like that that's available? Yes, that's that's the capability. The problem with buy now pay later solution is that um, they are trying uh, the the notion of having like a branded checkout experience, which is like buy now pay in installments, doesn't work in B two B. And the reason why is because you can't be a, a third party brand in an industry that everything is relationship oriented. So what we saw in behalf and other companies is that you get negative biased as the buy now pay later company because the good ones will not, you know, connect to a third party solution, like a branded thing, like a, think of like a firm for B2B, it doesn't matter what brand is it is. Mm -hmm. um, so they will just go to the vendor and say, hey, what is this? We don't provide this entity information and then all the all the buyers that come into this solution are with bad FICO scores doesn't have enough data and the experience is bad for everyone because the declines are really high because it's very risky and the buy now pay data company doesn't make any money the vendor doesn't get a value and the buyers are getting declined um, so what Balance is doing is we are working from within the merchant. This is like the payment platform as a whole. So we take 100% of the payment stack and enable the merchant to provide payment terms. Mm -hmm. um, and the payment terms are much more flexible. So for example, in B2B, what makes it unique is that um, a lot of the time, the moment you start counting the payment terms is not in the moment of checkout. A transaction in B2B is not, you know, in B2C, you go to the checkout, you click paying with card, and it starts and end in this point. In B2B, the transaction is based on milestones. So you want to trigger the payment on the invoice only after delivery, for example. If you look at companies like doing wholesale, it's very, very common. So balance with their APIs enable that type of payment journey that starts the payment terms only with an invoice and all of that flexibility that B2B needs. Um, so that's, I think, the main differences. Um, so yeah, like it's, at the end, it has those two main capabilities. It's like consumer grade business checkout. You can get a self-serve invoice. You can send checks. We will collect them and credit to your account. You can send wires. We will do automatic reconciliation. You can pay with card or ACH and you can pay with terms. 
But the experience on the vendor side, which is our customer, is always simple, always a credit card like you're a B2C business. Um, um, and on top of that, yeah, question. Well, so this is, a, and this is something we're dealing with uh, looking into our, we're actually looking for a new banking partner, um, which is a whole another, we could probably spend a whole day talking about that. Um, <laughs> but um, if someone gets approved for, let's say, $100,000, and then they grow their business, they become more trustworthy. Can they like reapprove for more credit with you guys or how, how does that work? Of course. So everything is, is powering the merchant. So we give all those robust capabilities to the merchant and he can just ask the merchant like he always does, right? Can I get more line to purchase more? Hmm. And what the merchant will do is he will, he will say no problem. And he can just do checks from his own balance account and can, and can evaluate the risk from like, you know, with the new data, like he can ping the, the open banking platform to evaluate credit again. And he can ask us again if he has an offline documentation and we have an underwriting team. And he can also just leverage our risk capabilities to make decisions himself. So, so people are willing to sometimes override like, hey, they say he's a risk profile of X. We trust this guy. We're going to give him a little bit more. Is that? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. It happens a lot. Interesting. And then let me just, you know, and I don't, this is kind of the, the dirty world of people not paying, but what, ha what happens if just someone defaults? Like that's part of the business that model that you've created. You expect, you know, 1% defaults, half a percent defaults, and you guys have kind of already accounted for that default. Percent. Yeah. So, yeah. So at the end, when you think about the cost of, of, doing like the buy now pay later element is that there's the cost of capital right you're getting capital faster there's the cost of risk getting defaults or getting even delinquency events and delinquency events someone didn't pay on time there's a donning process there's the process of collecting uh the which costs. costs money yeah yeah, yeah which costs money yeah. so you can decide how much of this you want to forward to balance. Balance has the entire stack that we can take. So it starts from like taking everything and you just get paid super easy. Um, and you can decide there's different configuration because the platform is so flexible. You can decide that you want to take some of it to your to, to mm. your own company and then the pricing will be That's just- That's super interesting. So if you're like, hey, we're, we got this down, we trust ourselves. We're going to pay you less because we we just want you to do these pieces exactly yeah so um, is there an upper limit uh, to like how big orders are that pass through pass the, through you what's i mean the biggest they, order you've seen what's the biggest order ever on on balance 60 million dollars <laughs> so, actually it was uh, one one point two million dollars wow uh, <laughs> in steel so we have marketplaces in steel Sure. Uh, so it's it's pretty heavy. Like those uh, those industries are, you know, you buy supply of steel. It's a lot. Like it's not like buying candles in a wholesale like fair or something. So so yeah. I have a, a question for you. I'm familiar with some people who work in mining. Some people who work in um, uh, I, I just forgot the word wind power. You know, like windmills, this sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, a lot of that extraordinarily expensive stuff, the transactions that go back and forth are, are often in the millions. Is, is Do you anticipate balance ever getting involved in that kind of world as well? I think so. I think that at the end, and if I'm, zoom, if I'm doing a zoom out from balance for a second, the, the economy is changing. What we do, B2B, it's not what we do, like what we as a collective are doing, the innovators of the B2B world, um, it will probably be the next industrial revolution as I see it, right? Because I know it, it sounds like I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. I don't think the industry talks about it enough, but when you create alternatives for buyers, we have uh, one of our customers, his name is Choco, right? It's a, it's a B2B uh, marketplace for ordering food. Mm -hmm. So, so buyers, restaurants can now choose who, who, who is the vendor they want to work with on a, like a, a weekly basis. 
And that creates competition that wasn't exist before. Mm -hmm. And prices go down and margins go up. And that can change the restaurant industry forever. Now, if you take that and obviously providing vendors with the ability to acquire new buyers, right? It's like buyers have more options. So they have reduction in cost. There's more competition. Vendors has more capabilities to acquire new buyers. Thus, the economy of the vertical mm -hmm. is being more and more um, effective. Now, we, we see that in a lot of different verticals. We see it in steel, as I was saying, construction, laboratory equipment, chemicals, mm -hmm. you name it, medical supply, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. So the industry, this wave of innovation will change everything. The cost of living for everyone will not be the same if we continue that in, the, in this path. So I do think the mission of B2B e-commerce is so big that it is just mind blowing. It's mind blowing. There's nothing in technology that can drive so much innovation as digitalizing the economy. Well, and, uh, and, and one follow yeah. up on that. I mean, I, I tend to think that, and some of the conversations we've had on our podcast, this also ties in with uh, sort of governments and foundation funds and all these sorts of things uh, too. You know, the nonprofit world, when you look at something like, you know, the Gates Foundation or whatever, the billions and billions of dollars of money that is, uh, you know, transferred around in some way or another, right? You know, so there are application processes and, you know, money is going back out and the way the governments transfer money, you know, talking about whatever the initiative was called to get, uh, um, you know, COVAX, you know, the COVID vaccines around the world. Well, money's transferring all the time for that, right? I mean, uh, all the time. So how, what is the most efficient way to do that? You know, and that's where balance and, and others in your space can come in. But, but I think you bring up a good point because if you think about like a product, especially a more complex product, like all the B2B components, like even the manufacturer, it's like they have to go buy all the supplies from like the steel and whatever. And all those, they might have to like call a rep and like there's so much like manual process to get everything just to get that one product. And then that product goes probably might go to a distributor that might go to a retail. Like there's so many layers. If you go, not just the product to the consumer, but how do you even make that product? Because product itself is usually consists of other B2B orders, right? That also go through the same like slow process. And all of that could be much, much more automated. I mean, I still think there's a very important aspect to having salespeople and but they need to be more useful and not just taking orders, right? Like the, the process of taking orders, I think is going to be more and more automated. Yeah. And, you know, automation is, is the mean. Like the, it, at the end, when you have automation in place, you can create that sophistication in the market like think of the, and by the way this is why amazon business is going crazy you saw the numbers yeah like yeah. it's the most successful Every business <laughs> day yeah it's like unreal it's um, bigger than all these like giant distributors right like it's it's already no, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous like it's just ridiculous amazon is like not a real company it's it's like a, what what is this like it's not <laughs> <laughs> like it's yeah. it's not no one it's like i don't know anyway like what's interesting is that to to do that type of change to change how the economy works you need strong players like amazon and others to drive not only the the order online piece, but the change of perception the change of like the attitude towards innovation and this is the biggest change that we see right now at Balance. We see B2B marketplaces in just every vertical. And for buyers, if, if the marketplace works even okay, there is no reason why you will not use a, a good model like a marketplace to just find better products, higher value, lower cost. So 
I'm really excited about how it will look like in a few years from now because yeah, you, this you, it's happening. One of the things that that you just touched on that uh, that's a favorite topic, uh, I think of ours in, in some ways too, is is how expectation drives innovation. Right? My expectations are different now that because of you know companies like Amazon and because of a whole variety of other players out in the space, out in the marketplace. You know, it's different now than it was three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. And I couldn't have envisioned it, you know, 20 years ago, right? It's just completely different. So my expectation is now, you know, way up here. It's like, well, it's got to be X, right? It's got to be up here. So that's going to drive us to that level. And then by the time we get there, the expectations will change again. And that's that's completely true. And and you know what's, what's really exciting about this is that the result of it is not efficiency or... I don't know, cooler experience. Uh, those are capabilities that will drive lower cost of living because B2B is in the basics of everything. It's the economy. It's not, it's just everything. And I don't know, the, the, the opportunity is so big that it's hard to even grasp it in your head, like to wrap yeah, your head around the it. The industry is massive, right? Like just the... You know, yeah. electrical supplies B two B. Like you could just make a like each one of these is like you know hundred <laughs> billion or even like a trillion dollars, right? For yeah, like one, these, one niche, right? <laughs> and, you know, and one thing I, I wanted to throw to you. This is a wild card question. I'm just going to throw it out there. But I was involved in a uh, a group that was talking about environmental sustainability and e commerce. Right. I mean, you know how, and you can come at this from a million angles. It's the packaging. It's it's grouping together orders so they're happening once. Where do you see a payment platform playing in that space? Like when you're talking about sustainability or achieving something, like to you know help the planet in some way. Where is payment in all of that conversation? I'm not sure where it really needs to play right now. That's a really good question. So. I think those those traditional businesses are using a lot of resources to make orders. Um, and I think, you know, balance is taking a part in a more, as you said, like grouping orders and those type of things. We have uh, one of our customers is a, is a publicly traded company uh, doing freight. Um, so they digitalizing they are so brave like they took the, their entire business it's a really big business okay and they took everything and they are now trying to do it self-serve online and part of the ability to do it is so what it introduced to the world is algorithms that can optimize how shipment is being done right how do you maximize uh, the space, how you maximize scheduling to make every shipment something that is very, very effective from a cost perspective. But they can't really do it online if they can solve the bottleneck of a payment. Because if they, if they do all of that in a self-serve way, they get the demand, and now they need to do all those orders in the account receivable side offline, they, they are just stuck. And I think we see it a lot in B2B e-commerce. You develop the platform, you invest so much, and the adoption is problematic because it's getting stuck in the payment side. It, get, it gets back to the ERP, and now everything is offline again. Again, offline. Yep. And if you don't solve the flow, you just get stuck, and then everything goes back again to the offline. That, that's, a, that's what I wanted to get uh, ask you about. I mean, what we're seeing that's been challenging, you know, we're, we're work with like, you know, anywhere from like high tech startups to, but we do work with a lot of like these historical B2B companies and these specifically these historical B2B companies. It's interesting to me because they're, they're somehow surviving and some of them are growing but they're very resistant to changing processes. Like everything lives in the ERP. Then we talk to the ERP, the ERP APIs are too slow to do certain things. Like we have, you know, or they can only do some level of real-time pricing. For instance, like the ERP's pricing API is too slow 
to calculate the price for more than one product in real time. Like you can only do like one variation. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Like all of a sudden it's like, that you have all these like crazy limitations. And then it's like, well, then what do you do? Do you take that data and put it into the e-commerce platform? But now you have this like super complicated integration to like merge the data and the systems are too different. So, I mean, what do you see? Innovation, my friend, innovation. What do you see these companies doing to, I mean, I think balance is definitely part of the equation, but I think it's also, it's complicated, right? It's, it's, it's payments, it's shipping, it's the ERP, it's their culture. And then they're also, then we'll get them a quote. We're like, look, we can actually solve these problems. We're gonna have to get creative. It's gonna be X, Y, Z. And they're like, our budget is half. And I'm like, well, then you can't, what do you, we're not gonna be able to do it. <laughs> and then they go out and try and find someone that agrees to do it for half and it, and it fails or it doesn't really work. You know what I mean? And, and this is what we're seeing time and time again. And they're just not right. making that much progress because they either don't want to spend the money or they don't want to change their processes to make it easier to do the project. Do, do you see what I'm yeah, saying? Think, <laughs> of course they say. Infrastructure is all, man. Infrastructure for those companies is in the 90s or, yeah, like early 90s. Yeah. And the problem with, you know, I worked at big, big companies with all tech, um, trying to innovate in those companies is so hard. It's so hard to build better API. So the the mission of innovating and taking the step forward at the end sits on the customer side, which is annoying and sad, but I, I get their point of view. Like you, it's hard to imagine how impactful um, self-serve is and how significant it is because I don't, and, and I'm talking about the technology side on B2B, I don't think we're good enough at explaining the value. We, don't, we are not good enough at explaining what can happen uh, because everything is new. In B2C, it's so easy. Improve conversion in 1% and you yeah. get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. why we started the podcast. B2C's I was listening, just sorry to interject. I was listening, I was looking online. There's a thousand podcasts increase your conversions, use Clavio, you know, do some Facebook ads. It's like you hit these buttons and you do the right things and you create cool content and your numbers go up. But B2B, it's like, well, we're not increasing revenue. We just want to move it online, right? And then they're like, well, I don't want to spend a bunch of money to do that, right? So then it's like, well, how do you get them to spend more money to do that if they don't see the value? Like, exactly. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it's- No, it's, no, you're touching exactly the right point. I it's think- It's the passion. It's the passion coming through, Isaiah. That's what it is. <laughs> but but yeah, yeah, we can't, how do, you, how do you get over that value? You know, you're getting to it, but- Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, at the end it's, it's great on our side as technology providers to say, to aggregate the data, to do the analysis, to do the hard work, to expla to exclaparate, to do like the, um, the analysis of how it looks like if we can see the trend here, what can happen to your business here? And we're getting there. Um, it's a process, but I think already we see like really interesting numbers and I think there's a second order effect to efficiency and going digital, which is something that the industry doesn't talk about enough, is the ability to acquire new buyers. So when, when in business goes online today and they say, okay, it's time to go online, let's build any B2B e-commerce, we wanna have a, a better experience for our customers, there's like, it's a new standard, blah, 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 blah. They don't think really about the ability to make more revenues or acquire new buyers with digital media and those type of things. And I think the, the conversation is getting there, but think of a world when everyone that comes to, uh, you know, everyone's that built that wants to build the B2B e-commerce experience. The first thing you're talking about is not the digitalization of it or the efficiency. You're talking about the ability to make more money that's that's a different conversation to have and it's a more exciting one and the people in the room will be different and everything will be different um and i think it's something that we need to be better off 
um, as on the technology side. And, you know, it's hard for them because it's B2B. Everything, even, even building a website is new to the industry. So now it's like the second layer, but I think we're getting there. Like we need to do it. Uh, because they can't do it themselves. It's too, it's too much for them. I also they have so much work in digitalizing the business, so much work of thinking about how to change things. So it's hard. It's hard for them to do the jump. Uh, I, I also think that they need to realize the risks of not doing it, right? I think if you don't do act, it and, every, and more and more people do do it, there's a big risk of losing customers. I think one of the things that's kept you to be alive is there companies don't switch because it's hard to switch. I've got my next net 60 terms and I buy my steel. Let's go, you know, let's use the steel example. I buy my steel from the sky for the last 30 years. But now all of a sudden, if there's a hundred marketplaces or a hundred websites where I can just go on and self-serve for great prices and use balance, it's like the switching cost goes way down and exactly. you're losing customers. So now you need to start acquiring customers. So I think a lot of B2B companies I've gotten really complacent. I've, I've asked companies literally sure of how, how do you guys get new customers? And they literally go silent. They can't even answer how they get new customers. Like they haven't and like, it's insane. I'm like, so you literally don't know. And I think even like I've had CEOs on the call, like not answer the question. I'm like, how does a CEO not answer this question? Like what, what is going on? It's like a $50 million company. Like it's crazy. I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll give you guys another, another example. So, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work with health and wellness businesses and, and, you know, some of those companies overlap with food companies with the ingredients, you know, the sourcing that they're looking for. There may be something, you know, herbal or what have you that they're looking for, you know, for their particular product or for expansion of a product line. So they're creating these products for, you know, consumers, it's B2C. And they cannot, you know, break through uh, into certain uh, chemicals and to certain uh, herbs and to certain what have you all around the world. They've gotten, they get like PDFs mailed to them, you know, they get stuff sent that's an attachment that's just a list with no pictures. It's like code numbers. I, I worked with somebody who had to travel to literally to Madagascar, right? This is crazy, in order to understand the difference in chocolates, right? Because it's, it's famous for its chocolates. And they have a, wow. a chocolate company in Brooklyn, in New York. And they had to travel there because they couldn't figure out what the hell these chocolates were, even though it was like the best source in the world to get these different types. It was the of only way. They're like the only way we're going to know for sure is we got to fly over. Yeah. And, and, and that's mind-boggling. That that's the case in 2021. It's mind-boggling, right? So it's amazing. Yeah. So, so I wanted to. Oh, I, one more funny story because actually, Bar, I think there was one company where I finally like I kept asking. Finally, like some guy was like, well, they search for us. We we're talking about how they get new customers. And I was like, so how? Like, oh, they search on Google. So I'm like, so the way you get new customers is Google and you have zero SEO strategy. You don't have any focus on e-commerce. Like if that's the way customers find you, you should be putting all your time and effort into mm -hmm, exactly. like, e-commerce experience because that's how you're going to grow SEO, right? But like they, don't they hadn't know. connected the fact that that's like, how do you get more SEO? Like you build a good website and you. <laughs> exactly. That's they correct. just don't, they can connect the dots in B2C. It's obvious in B2B. It's starting to be interesting. That's like where we are today. <laughs> and to be honest, it's our responsibility because they are, they live in a world when everything is relationship based. They live in a world with low growth. Um, they don't know. They just don't know. They don't know. Someone needs to educate. Someone needs to facilitate the discussion. And I think it's us because it's too damn hard for them to even think about it. They who are just do it? Maybe... <laughs> what? I said, who else is going to do it? I guess that's the problem. It, right? it, is, it is the impetus behind, you know, our podcast. And I'm really glad you mentioned that. I mean, our listeners who've, who've been faithful and have listened to, you know, many, many of these episodes know we're, we're trying to hammer home that point. You know, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we're bringing on as many experts as we possibly can to talk about this and bring up, you know, all these considerations. But, you know, it's it, it's just the beginning for B2B e-commerce. It really is. It's just the beginning. There is so much that can be done 
And in the next 20 yeah. years, I don't know where we're going to be, but it'll be a lot further ahead than where we are right now. It's really interesting. You, talk, you, you talked about the point of, uh, of now you don't have a choice. So there's, there are verticals that you really don't have a choice anymore. So I will not say names, but we well, have some. Do. Uh, please do. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't want to get in trouble. We won't get you in trouble with your customers. So. <laughs> no, so there's like we have some B2B marketplace in wholesale. Okay. Yeah. Wholesale, as you know, Fair is the biggest player uh, sure. right now online. Um, doing an amazing job. And Marcelo, one of the founders, and everyone there are great, very, very aggressive. Now, we just started to, so it started with like marketplaces coming to Bounds and say, okay, we need to have that capability of like making payments uh, more similar as the net 60 terms, uh, so forth, so forth. And now when you have like four strong B2B marketplaces right now, um, and a little secret, one of the biggest e-commerce platform, the biggest B2B e-commerce platform, not even B2B, is building a B2B marketplace right now. We, go, we will talk about it when I make sure I can talk about it. But <laughs> at the end, what it does um, for all the vendors in the space is it's like what Amazon did in B2C, right? All mm -hmm. of a sudden, you have two options. One, you just sell on those platforms and, and you're paying 25% commission. Like this is a real number, okay? Or you need to invest a lot, a lot in your e-commerce experience because you're dead otherwise. And it's true for wholesale. Um, it will become more and more true for um, food ordering in restaurants. We have a good visibility there because we have customers that are B2B marketplace in, in food. In steel in North America, it's almost there already. And we see just more and more in chemicals, it's the next. Listen, what's happening right now, it's like a wake up call for everyone. Like it happened faster than everyone thought because um, it's not the old companies, the traditional companies that are doing the digital transformation that made that industry what it is, what I just mentioned. It's the venture-backed, Sequoia-backed, Bessemer-backed, battery-backed companies that are innovators, entrepreneurs, super small people having a lot of money, building marketplaces and just taking over. So this is why it's happening so fast and no one even seems to get it, how fast it's happening. Um, so I so think we have that visibility because most B2B marketplaces that are venture backed are like coming to balance because they know balance from, because our investors are like well known. So we have that uh, network. Um, but this is why I want, what, what I want to scream in this podcast is like, mm -hmm. listen, it's happening much faster than you thought, much faster. And it's very aggressive and it's in its go time. There's no, there's not a lot of time. So, so I, I really appreciate this point because, and Brian, are you familiar with Brian Beck? He's been on our podcast. He's kind of one of the early B2B guys that was big about B2B, wrote a B2B book. And, and he says, he thinks eventually it'll be too late for, if you read his book, it even says that. And it's like three years old book. <laughs> it's like an old yeah. book, now, which is old in our, you know what I mean? Like three years ago, I was like, man, we already saw all this stuff happen, but, um, what point do you think it's too late for some of these? I know it's, it depends on the industry. It depends on the business, um, especially for these distributors that don't make the product, at least the manufacturers. You know, if you make a really good product, you can kind of survive being old school because, you know, you have the best product, you have a patent or whatever. But most of these guys don't have a unique enough product to, to, to insulate themselves. Like, are we talking three years, five years? And I know... This is a super general question, but like on average, when do you think that it's going to be like, hey, look, if you didn't do much, you're going to be kind of obsolete to the marketplaces and the companies that did build a good site themselves? Um, I think I think for products that are um, not very customized, so think of like the wholesale, right? It's a great example. You buy candles in wholesale, buy like those type of things. Um, those you have, uh, it already started, you have a year. You have a wow. year, you have a year and a half. Like it's now, 
Like it was, it it started like uh, two years ago. You don't have any time. And I'm I'm going to jump on that too because one of the things that and I'm so glad you said that because I kept thinking like you know when is this going to be? And I used to think oh 2025 to 2030. I no longer think that. Uh-huh. I think part of it is uh, also because of supply chain and COVID and all of the questioning people had to go through during this pandemic in the last year or two. Their businesses were shaken up in so many different ways. They had to look inward. And and I think that there are a lot of folks, the light bulb went off and they went racing ahead. And now other folks are really trying to figure out how to how to deal with it. So 2022, 23, you know, you're not going to have a lot of time to figure things out. Yeah. And Again, I'm like blown away from like, if like every time I'm thinking, hmm, interesting, what verticals entrepreneurs didn't took over and build like really good B2B marketplaces. And every time when I think of a vertical like this, like a week later, we get like an inbound from like a laboratory equipment. Like, <laughs> what is that? Like a B2B marketplace for laboratory equipment, really? And it's successful, like what? That's it's great. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's much 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 faster and it's always like this in technology because okay. entrepreneurs are hungry and they move and fast that's where these older b2b companies are really not getting it because they're like oh i gotta spend two hundred thousand on a new site or three hundred thousand it's like these marketplace and new companies they have like 20 engineers that's like three million dollars of payroll on engineering right like they're, they don't realize how insignificant they're spending on tech and trying to get a, a lower you know, bid on a project. They're just so underspending in this area that they're not even close. So you know, it's like it's what are they, coming to a gunfight with a, with a knife or like a, a sock is on. Like they're exactly. so far off. They don't realize how far off they are. You know? <laughs> exactly. it's, like, it's like the cost of one engineer in, in the U.S. right now. Yeah, they're like, like, our budget is the cost of one engineer. Can you do like integrate everything, design everything, build everything, fix all our product data? Like they want everything. And it's like, all right, our budget is 100 grand. And they're like, they think that's a lot. I'm like, I'm serious though. I have have these conversations all the time where they, maybe their budget's 200 grand. Like these guys think that's a huge budget. They don't. (laughs) Like it's really <laughs> fun to put it in that perspective because it's so accurate. Like they don't understand how the competition look like. It's moving too fast for them to figure it out. Yeah. And again, I think I'm gonna tie it back to what we said before. It's our responsibility to educate. Mm-hmm. Um, and we need to have a very robust strategy on how to do it together. We need to hold hands and do it because. I think it's very important um, that it will ha- that this change will happen with them. It will not have those like Amazon's based verticals that will I mean, take over. Part of why I think this is important because you know if they don't do something and all these companies die out, like that's I mean it's going to be like ten you know just like you have Facebook and Google, you'll have like you know the same thing, but in this exactly. case it would just destroy like so many small businesses if they don't adapt. Right, which is kind of like scary. What is it? The dystopia, like we all work for Amazon. We might as well just all go work for Amazon, right? Like at that exactly. <laughs> the big brother. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think we still need to keep some competition alive, right? That's part of why we're <laughs> trying but, to. But, you know, one thing I pointed out to uh, a friend of mine, and, and they're a small early stage startup. They're B two C. But, you know, we were talking about, you know, big, big players like Amazon out there. And the same day that I met with them, you know, Amazon announced that they were hiring like another 125,000 people or, you know, and it just really like, guys, that's, that's what we always have to keep in mind. It's like, you know, they're the startup, there are three people, you know, and Amazon announces they're hiring another 125,000. And so, you know, this is the world that we're in right now. Yeah. It's amazing. It's so unsymmetrical. Like there's nothing like this. Exactly. We are hiring uh, two countries. Um, so uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's it's great. I mean, I you know I live near New York City, right? And so New York, there's yeah. there's a, a an Amazon you know campus, a small campus there, but it's a small campus with like twelve thousand employees. And then there's a 
a Google campus in New York City that has like 14,000 employees. And so, and then there's a Facebook campus. So like all of these things are just like they're satellites, you know, they're not even the main ones. And so it, it, it just really gives a lot of perspective to the kinds of things that we're talking about, the challenges that people are up against and, you know, what, what they have to be working on. So, so we're running, we're running out of time here, but um, can you tell us what do you see coming in the next, you know, two to three years? I mean, obviously you, you made it very clear and I agree that, that there's not that much time left to innovate, especially if you sell something that's fairly straightforward and doesn't require crazy customization. Um, you know, or what, what advice do you have for people that are, that need to do something like be hungry. Um, like for the customers, I would say, um, wake up and be hungry. Um, you don't understand um, how little uh, how little effort you're putting right now in technology when you compare it to competitors. And the baseline is the competitors, is not what you did before. And that's a big change in how you see things. Mm -hmm. For us, um, we need to start making the discussion more aggressive around, I, I will give you just one, uh, one more bite about like the B2B marketplace side. I'm not doing a good enough job in reflecting to the world of B2B e-commerce, the advancements in B2B marketplaces on the venture backed side. And we have both of them in our line of sight like we see how fast B2B marketplaces are moving in which verticals, and we see how slow it's happening in the traditional world. And I have a lot of empathy for like the traditional world. Like I, I feel like it's a personal mission that I'm not doing good enough job with in making them realize that it's now or never. Um, so I think this is like the message to the, the message to the world is. Um, the, the venture backed scene is hot on making B2B digital. And when they are hungry about something, they move fast. So pay attention. I mean, look at Uber, right? They just killed taxis in three years, right? Like, like this. The only time I take a taxi is from the airport because it's sometimes easier and it, it, they have the taxi line. That's like literally the only time I've taken a taxi in the last like five years. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Once, yeah, once like change, literally that's <laughs> yeah. Once the change machine begins, uh, it, it really you really can't do anything about it. You've got to just keep going. You've got to just push. And I, I'm with you on this. You gotta gotta work, 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 and and then and, uh, work some more. And I'll add one more thing because I think the VC companies generally move the fastest because they have the money. They pump the money into engineering and they really push hard. Um, and they're not afraid to fail, right? Because they'll pump it into 20 and it's okay if only three succeed. So, um, but I'm also seeing some innovation in the PE back world. So private equity back B2B companies are starting to get a little smarter. I had a conversation. He was the CTO of, um, which is interesting because you usually don't get to talk to someone technical on the private equity side. It was a CTO at a, at a private equity company and they were really like sort of on top of, the B2B innovation. Um, yeah. And yeah. so those companies are also going to be pushing. So these non, you know, kind of private equity VC backed companies, I feel like are really, they gotta, they gotta realize that, Hey, look, you two, these two guys with a lot of money, two different arms with a lot of money are investing a lot in this. <laughs> yeah. And, and they are not, and they are not fearful of not making enough money. Right, it's they don't need to keep like the eight percent margin. They just move fast, and they are they are okay with thinking long term. And I think that's also a big piece of it. Like think yeah. long term. They'll they'll dump money in, maybe have a zero percent year because they're building exactly. out the structure to take you know an extra fifty percent of the market. Right. Well, yeah. you know, one thing I want to touch on in a future episode because we're going to have to have you back as a guest is I want to hear about your degree in philosophy because I have a degree in religion and here I am in tech, right? I mean, so, oh, nice. But, uh, we should talk That's about that at some point. How about yeah. we'll spend an episode talking about the philosophy of technology, right? Or you know, there you go. <laughs> By the way, that was what I did—the philosophy of, of history and technology. Really, very interesting. Very yeah, interesting. Yeah.
Excellent. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Mar. This is amazing. We'll have to definitely have you back on. And, and I, I have a feeling in three to six months, you'll probably have all sorts of new stories for us at the pace you guys are moving. So, yeah. Thanks for another great episode. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you. Great.